can a person believe works are necessary for salvation and still be saved? And I say, no, you, you have to understand the gospel that is faith apart from works. You cannot, you cannot um, share your, your faith with part on Jesus and part on your own works. It's got to be entirely 100% faith in Jesus. If a person doesn't understand and believe that, then they don't understand the gospel and they would not be saved. However, there are cases uh, that, like what we find in the book of Galatians where people get saved. Uh, and look at this study we did on a Wednesday night on the book of Galatians. And you'll see that these people were legitimately saved. But then after Paul left them, the, the Judaizers came in and poisoned their minds with uh, with works uh, uh, message, and they uh, went into apostasy. However, they were still saved. It's just that now they are believing a false gospel. Okay, so uh, uh, Renee, what you are about to answer the question? Yes. Uh, also, uh, Nori came in. We haven't seen him for a little while, and we need to pray for his baby son, who is one of the twins, baby Nori. Uh, he's in intensive care right now. So please add him to the prayers. Um, again, uh, Chris and his friend has a spinal leak. We need to pray for her. I think she may have put her first name in the chat by now. If not, God knows who she is, as well as Anthony M., who's been sick for five days. Um, so I wanted to make sure, in case you didn't hear those uh, prayer needs, that I repeated them. Um, yeah, I uh, absolutely I agree with Luke. Uh, the Bible says that we received the Holy Spirit when we first trusted in Christ. And to trust Christ means that you know that he shed his blood for you on Calvary. His blood paid your sin debt. He died once for all. So uh, it, the sacrifice never needs to be repeated. Uh, it's all the sins for your lifetime. Uh, it's forward and backwards from the cross, the Old Testament and New Testament. They were all saved by the cross. Um, and if if you've trusted what he did and you know you have eternal life because of his death, burial and resurrection, that's the gospel message that you are reconciled to God. You are born into God's family because you trusted Christ. So that means you trusted what he did on Calvary, gave you eternal life. So if you believe that works are required to help get you saved, one, it's very clear in scripture that's not the case. Uh, it says salvation is for him that worketh not, but believes uh, on him who justifies the ungodly. Faith is counted for righteousness. So uh, if you believe works are necessary, are you trusting Christ? No, because you're trusting something you're doing. You, you still think something needs to be done instead of it was finished. Uh, Jesus already did it. So I, in my heart, I, I sure hope that a lot of the professing Christians that are wrong on the gospel or believe wrong now, uh, that they are saved. Um, but one of the reasons I started my ministry is I got really a, a, a gut feeling, a pain in my heart for people sitting in the church every week. Uh, and these verses like Christ is of no effect unto you, which of course can be, you know, uh, uh, contextually used for your spiritual walk. He's of no effect to you. If you're justified by the law, you're going to walk in condemnation. You're not going to be able to grow. But if you're not saved, and you're trusting in the law or your, your works, he is of no effect to you. So I don't know how you could be saved. Uh, you're not saved by believing uh, Jesus is the son of God or any fact about him. You're saved because of the work he did on Calvary. So you either believe that what he did on Calvary reconciled you to God, paid your sin debt and gave you eternal life, or you don't. And you'll get some kind of religion like Catholicism or all these Protestant uh, breakoffs that also believe it's some kind of process that uh, you've got to do and add your own works in. And there's all kinds of clever ways they preach works and say they're not works. So uh, a lot of places, a lot of people are very confused. So I believe there's some people 
that are in this era, but are saved because um, ultimately I believe a lot of people just cry out to God for mercy and, and believe on the cross. Uh, but they're sitting under a, a lordship teacher because the Calvinism has infiltrated the Baptist churches. You got John MacArthurites and R.C. Sproul and people like that uh, preaching error, um, using the right terminology, grace through faith, free gift, but then turn around and preach works and then tell you, oh, no, it's not works. So people can be confused after they're saved. Like uh, Brother Luke pointed out in the book of Galatians, he said, oh, foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? It's like, who mesmerized you and took you away from the truth? And then asked them, hey, having begun in the spirit, are you now made hurt by the flesh? Because they were told they had to get circumcised. He's like, wait a minute, you got the spirit by the hearing of faith, not works of the law. So um, it's true. A person can get saved and go right into error. There's a reason for this. Uh, Paul is constantly going back and confirming the truth of the gospel, the simplicity in Christ, uh, because you will not move on to perfection or mature in your walk as long as you're stuck there. If you're stuck there, you're going to walk in condemnation. Even if you're saved and you try to walk by the flesh and works of the law, you're going to stay in condemnation. And you're not going to grow spiritually. You have to abide in his grace to grow and mature. That's why the book of Hebrews, they were saved. But he said, let's not lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Uh, let us move on to perfection. Right. But they should have been teachers by now. But somebody had confused them and they were still trusting in the Levitical law and the temple system in the second temple period. So. Um, it's possible a saved person can think you got to have works to be saved if they have sat under a wrong teaching or misunderstood scriptures. Um, but if they never trusted Christ, if they never understood what the gospel message is, see, here's the thing. This is why the ministry was started, because I think there's a lot of people thinking they're already saved and they are the hardest people to get saved. And they really think that, that salvation is a reward that you get for living a, as a good Christian. And that's just not the case. So I do think there's a lot of unsaved people in the churches. Um, there is a ton of false teaching. It is rare to find the purity of the gospel. Even independent fundamental Baptist churches are starting to bow to this kind of pressure by these Calvinists and, and reformed theologians. So uh, yeah, a, per, a safe person could believe that, but they, they need to be brought back to the truth or they're just going to be stuck in their walk. They're, they're either going to get puffed up in self-righteousness and self-deception, or they're going to become hopeless. And both of those are really bad and they're not good for uh, growth in the church or for uh, the name of Christ. So, uh, you know, if they never trusted Christ and they never, believe that what Jesus did was enough, then I don't know how they are because you get the Holy Spirit by trusting him and they haven't trusted him in that case. Amen. Well said, sister. Now, brother Jordan, before you answer, I want to just respond to something in the chat room very, very briefly here. Uh, we have, um, um, let me see, um, Boof E. Now, Booth, I, I, I don't recognize your name, so maybe you're new here. Thank you for coming and welcome. Uh, but Booth E has uh, posed a very interesting follow-up question. And Booth, we're going we're gonna to answer that question, but uh, let, let's let Brother Jordan answer the initial question. Then we're going to come back and answer your, your question. But in the meantime, uh, Brother Ben really led your the right direction with his answer. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to your answer, Booth, in a minute. But uh, Brother Jordan, go ahead to give us your initial answer. Yeah. <clears throat> so certainly false. Um, because the thing is, you know, when we're talking about the Galatians and, you know, the work salvationists will say, well, you can fall from grace. See, it's right there in the Bible. But the reason they're falling from grace is they're adding their works. Because if you add works, grace is no more grace. And thus, you are falling from it because you're not resting in it. And we're looking here in Romans 4, 5. But to him that worketh not 
but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now, uh, I, I think both people have already made wonderful points, so I'm not going to reiterate. I share all those thoughts. I guess what I will use my time to do is kind of explain how some people will disguise faith as or works as faith. For example, I know the Church of Christ, they equate baptism and faith together. So they will say it's faith, that faith is our saving grace, but they equate the two words together. Everybody will say it's faith unless you're part of a system like Roman Catholicism, and then they'll just jump over to James 2.24 and say that uh, faith alone is dead. Like the, They'll take it all out of context. Um, and then Calvinists will do a mixture of the two. They'll say it's grace through faith. Backload works because if you don't have works, which they make their works the assurance of their salvation rather than the cross the assurance of their salvation and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then they themselves will also put their own twist on the book of James and say, see, faith without works is dead. And this is where you get a lot of your um, vernacular of saving faith. And this is something that I went off about the other night off stream with Sister Renee. It's like, the Bible doesn't say saving faith. <laughs> it's faith. And she brought up a really good point that the Bible says you only need the faith of a mustard seed. I think a lot of times we get too focused on our faith and we're like, well, I don't know if I have enough faith. What it, How are we measuring that? Anytime we are putting the focus back on ourselves or we are relying on a system, a leader, and that's something that people will often do. They'll rely on something else and they're willing to stake their entire eternity just so they don't have to say they're wrong, which is why I say that pride is the most dangerous sin. Um, all sins are dangerous, but pride blinds people. Yes, lust is such a dangerous sin and it's the most evident sin and Sometimes it seems like it causes the most destruction, but a majority of wars we're out here fighting come from a place of pride. So I think it's very important to remember that faith is nothing but faith, trusting in Jesus, taking Jesus at his word, not taking all these other men like our Arminians, Calvins, all these fun little systems we have, and the teachings that came from a man. I always say that if you can trace your theology back to a man, and that man is not Jesus Christ, you haven't gone back far enough. We need to remember that our assurance of salvation does not rely on ourselves or what other men, like, there's going to be numerous people that will always point to us and say, oh, they're not actually saved, they're not producing enough works because they're using themselves as the standard. That's the exact same mistake the Pharisees made back in the time of Jesus's ministry. Jesus is our standard, our unattainable standard outside of faith and trust in him because he was the only person who was able to perfect and complete the law, which the law is fulfilled through him by putting trust in him. We have now fulfilled the law. So when we put ourselves back under the law, we are saying, Jesus, I can actually do it myself. And we can't. <laughs> and that's where pride gets us. So people will often attack our doctrine. That's why we're called easy believism, because the rest of the world just wants to be very scared of the simplicity of the gospel. They want to be co-saviors in their salvation. And it's just not a possibility. Okay, thank you, brother. Um, well, let me add a couple of things before we move on. The uh, there's a, I, I used to collaborate with a couple of brothers that I had to um, um, distance myself from because one day, uh, even though they believed the gospel, uh, they made it known to me that they thought that other people, uh, if they were in error uh, and they believed that Oh, 
faith in Jesus is not enough. You got to get water baptized too, or anything else that they want to add to faith. They said those people would still be saved, even though that they they, they didn't get it just exactly right. Uh, and so I tried to point out to them a couple of things. You look at you look at Romans uh, um, it's eleven six. It says, "And if by grace, then it is no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace." Uh, so Paul, uh, he really goes out of his way, and he is the one that is most important uh, of the, all the, uh, uh, the, the apostles, uh, all, everyone who contributed to the writing of the Bible. He's most important to make this point that it, your faith has to be completely in Jesus. You cannot mix it with anything else. And that's the point he's making in Romans. And in Galatians, he, he says... Um, um, I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Uh, there, there's more, but uh, the, the important thing for people to understand is that, uh, and, and what these brethren called me when I was stand, taking this stand against their position, they said, well, I'm a hundred percenter. And they, they, they said a hundred percenter as a, as, a, as a pejorative. You're one of those 100 percenters. And I, I did make a video uh, titled um, uh, Unadulterated Grace. Uh, and that means that, that uh, uh, adultery is not only a, a sexual sin, but adultery is, uh, is anything that's impure or not 100% as it, it's adulterated. And so um, it's, it is adultery to um, um, take the pure gospel and add something to it, and then you've ruined it. So, uh, yeah, we have to be 100 percenters. We have to have our faith completely in the person of Christ, the, the accomplishment of Christ on the cross for us, and his, the promise of Christ. We have to believe completely that that's the only reason and that's sufficient entirely. That if we, if we add anything else to it, the cross plus anything else nullifies it. You've ruined it. Uh, okay, uh, before we go to the follow-up question, Renee or Jordan, would you want to say anything more about this one? Oh, we could talk all night on it, so For no. free, all. <laughs> yeah, we, we could. Okay, so if you, if you didn't look in the chat room yet, let me just read that uh, follow-up question from Buff E. Uh, I've never heard this question before, too. I really find it quite fascinating. It never dawned on me that... Oh, I, I had... Oh, there it is. It says, Buff E wrote... Uh, if someone teaches a false gospel out of ignorance, but later comes to the truth, will they be cursed? Referencing Galatians 1.8. So in other words, they're teaching a false gospel. So that means according to Galatians 1.8, that those who teach this false gospel, they're, they're to be accursed. Um, and, uh, 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 but even though later on, and I would reverse that too. What if, what if they uh, were uh, to teach the real gospel, uh, and then later teach a false gospel, would they be accursed? Uh, and th that word accursed, of course, uh, Ben wrote a very good answer, and he, he likes to talk about this point uh, quite a bit. So uh, I, he gave you the right answer, I think. But let's before I try to answer it, Renee or, or Jordan, do you want to give Boop an answer? I would say no, they're not because... <laughs> Everybody up until the time they receive the correct gospel preaches an accursed gospel. Everybody has, I mean, that would include Muslims not being saved, um, Jehovah Witnesses not being saved. And we see this every day, converts for, for the glory of God. A person can start in error and be delivered from that error. Um, I understand what he is saying, but the type of language we're seeing there is to show, like, let them be a curse. Like, also, we're seeing separate yourself from that because that is a wicked doctrine. And it's the only one that can save. So if a person doesn't repent from that doctrine, they are under an accursed gospel. So if you remain under an accursed gospel you can't be saved. So the only other option is eternal separation, which we see all throughout the Bible is coined um, as the curse. 
Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, Sister Renee. What now, do you have now, to how, you, how did you word that? You want what Ben's belief on that it means set aside? Is that what? Um, yeah. Um, the um, uh, the you got the initial question. Do you want me to tell, tell about Ben's answer? Is the word anathema in Galatians one eight and elsewhere in Scripture simply means to set aside. So what is uh, marked, marked and avoided until they they change their uh, mind and heart towards the gospel of grace. So in other words, instead of being a curse, like okay, they're condemned to, to hell. No, they're not cursed in that uh, cursed in that sense. They are uh, anathema in that we have to uh, separate from them and and tell them that you know, look, you're you're anathema. Might, you're I teaching might, the whole gospel. Well, I might disagree with them on that a little bit. So what what uh what was the question before that? Is that well, goes with it. The, the, the initial question by Boof, Boof wrote, if someone teaches a false gospel out of ignorance, but later comes to the truth, will they be cursed? Oh, I see. Galatians 1.8. Okay. Well, uh, here we go. Let's say they were never saved, right? They went out and preached Jehovah's Witness, like you said, or some other false message. As soon as they believe, they're saved. I mean, there's nothing keeping them from being saved. I mean, it's not like uh, it's saying, let them be accursed and may they never not be accursed. That's not it. Uh, to be under the law is to be under a curse. And if you don't believe on Christ, if you haven't trusted Christ, the wrath of God abides on you. So if you're lost, you're lost. And I believe uh, it's if somebody uh, was saved in preaching something false like we believe some of the jews got converted but made the mistake of thinking you had to be circumcised and they were mixed up i, I don't think god's gonna not save them because they got confused and thought that judaism was still a thing i i don't so um i i don't think god's all legalistic like that i really think it's about does your heart trust what Christ did. So I, I try not to get too nitpicky about these things, but I I believe Ben could be right on the set aside, let him be accursed or anathema or set apart, uh, avoid it. Absolutely. That, that could be true. But uh, an angel from heaven, let him be accursed. I, I think it would be cursed. I, I think a person, because if they're preaching a false gospel, the person that believes the false gospel is under a curse, a literal one, because he's still lost. So uh, the wording might be harsh, and I, I don't want to have anybody use it against a saved person that might be in error. That guy's not a cursed. He's not going to hell. Uh, he's not damned forever. He's just in error. And so in that sense, I think Ben is right. It could be applied that way, as set aside and avoided. Uh, but again, if the person's lost and is preaching it, the curse still abides on them. It abides on everybody that's lost. If we could just keep it simple, people that trust Christ, saved, born again, eternally secure. People that have never trusted Christ, lost. Now, in between being saved and lost, there's a lot of issues. You could be saved and fall into error. You could be saved and lose your faith. You could be saved and have your faith shipwrecked. Uh, there's all kinds of things that can happen, but you're still secure. So the black and white here is, have they ever trusted Christ? So uh, if a person was lost in the preaching of false gospel, and then they believe correctly, are they still accursed? Of course not, because Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law, having been a curse for us. So no, the curse does not supersede the blood of Christ. It's not greater than the blood of Christ. I think it is correctly in the context Ben uses it for people that are saved that might be preaching wrong. Uh, but I also believe it could be literal because I think he believes very strongly against coming against the work that he had done. Uh, I think these are very harsh words Paul's using because every time he uh, get a church started, people were coming up behind him and, and and it really was a messenger of Satan constantly uh, accusing and and uh, persecuting him and undoing his work. And so I, I think he might have uh, meant it harshly. But of course, 
we could use it as set aside or avoid it as well if they were saved. I don't know why a saved person would be preaching wrong, but it's possible. We, we see in scripture that there were some Jews that believe but wouldn't tell that they believe because they didn't want to get kicked out of synagogue and stuff like that. So they were still doing second temple period uh, uh, Levitical law rituals and stuff, too. So I, I don't think God is going to be a legalist and say, no, you you did works of the law. I, you know, it's just, I don't think it's going to be like that. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, that's it. OK, I, I, I think everything has been said. I, what uh, you said, Jordan, that uh, everybody is preaching this gospel before they get saved anyway. This is the default message that the whole world believes that uh, salvation would based, be based upon our own establishing our own righteousness. Uh, working, uh, doing good works, getting sin out of our life, and going before God and say, "See, I'm, I'm good enough, aren't I?" That's that's the, that's what the world believes until they learn the truth of the gospel. So that would mean that every person is accursed. But, but what does accursed mean? Uh, accursed is not. Um, uh, there are a lot of people who would interpret that accursed as these people are condemned to hell, and that nothing's going to change that. Kind of like we look the word they look at the word reprobate okay they're done there's no hope for them ever uh, but uh so if we look at galatians 1 8 in the kjv uh it says um uh, let him be accursed uh in the uh amplified it says accursed uh, in the um nabre here it says accursed but if you look at the young's literal the young literal says uh anathema let him be Anathema. So the the young literal, if uh, if we want to go the the best translation as far as okay, what does it literally say? Well, what's the literal translation? It's anathema. And so we look up the word anathema, and I do think that we can uh, agree with what Ben's conclusion there is. If we look at anathema, it says uh, under synonyms for anathema, it has uh, abhorrent, hateful, odious, repugnant, so on. Uh, but it also has pariah, a pariah. Uh, uh, that is somebody, when you make someone a pariah, you are setting them aside and saying, you're, we find you're, you're repugnant. You cannot be anywhere near us. We're separating from you. So uh, I do think that uh, that is a, a real uh, legitimate uh, way of interpreting it. And we certainly would not ever, con we hope you don't conclude that this, um, being accursed, uh, or even if you're going to use uh, uh, anathema, uh, don't believe that it means that they're they're cursed to hell and and and, and now they are reprobate and nothing's going to change that because the gospel changes the the, the false gospel. Someone believes a false gospel once they believe the real gospel, regardless of what they did. Uh, now. As Renee said, the blood, the blood is what's what's needed to fix all these problems. So, uh, OK, uh, you want to say more, uh, Renee or uh, Jordan? I wanted to say one last thing. Um, well, actually, I wanted to answer a question that came up from Sue in the chat. She asked, what if that's what if that's what they were raised in and have never heard the true gospel? What I would say to that is anybody who dies without the saving faith in the one true gospel is destined to hell. It's unfortunate. Some people are exposed to more truth than others, but I believe God is drawing all people near to them. If they were raised in the faith, they had access to a Bible. They had access to prayer. So it's very unfortunate if they are never able to come to the true gospel, which is why I keep emphasizing not to rely on traditions, not to rely on mentors, always take everything you're taught to the word of God, including everything you hear on this panel. We are all infallible men and women. Um, the one way that you can uh, discern between biblical teaching and false teaching is what is it producing in your life? Is it producing joy or is it producing anxiety? If it's producing joy, you likely have the right gospel. If it's producing anxiety, you probably have a false gospel because a false gospel will always fall back on you and you know how unreliable you are and you know that the standard is too high. So it's very scary. It's terrifying when we think about if we had to save ourselves. We couldn't do it. 
So that's what I would say to answer your question, Sue. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't really get what what was the question again. What did you just answered? Uh, yeah. So her question was, what if that's what they were raised in, meaning that they had a false gospel, so they were raised to believe a false gospel, and um, have they and what if they've never heard the true gospel? Oh, so what happens to someone who never hears the gospel? That's yeah. the question. Yeah, oh, essentially, okay. well, yeah. That, that's 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 the that's the you know the standard question that everybody has to answer. Uh, uh, well, should we we go to that? Uh, and there's uh, other questions in the chat room, but we have a list of questions prepared. What what do you want to do? Uh, uh, you've already answered that, so let's let Renee give an answer to that. Renee. Well, what happens when people have only heard the false gospel and never heard the real gospel? Is that what the question yeah. is? Yeah, uh -huh. essentially. All right. Well, all right, here you go. Now, one thing I will say is if a person grew up in church and they grew up under believing you got to do this and that to get to heaven plus Jesus, I will say at least they kind of get the concept of what supposedly he did on the cross. They'll say, oh, he died for our sins, even though they don't trust what he did actually gave me eternal life. As you can see, because they all come against us for telling you it does. Um, I do believe there are those like even the Catholic, uh, hedonist Oscar Wilde said nothing but the blood of Christ can save me on his deathbed. So he came to the conclusion that he needed God's grace upon his death. And I believe in God's mercy, many people, if they're in a church, never born again, but they have kind of heard of Jesus. I believe he reveals to them, uh, that they need his grace. And they and they cry out and they get it. So uh, also, if a person never heard the gospel, the Bible is clear. You can see uh, that God says creation and conscience are witness of God's existence, and that whatever light, like whatever truth you respond for God, He'll give you more truth. And so I've seen miraculous ways God reveals the gospel to people. I've, I've heard of Muslims having dreams of it and supernaturally getting the gospel message in a place where you can't have a Bible or you're put to death. Uh, you can't leave Islam or hear the gospel without being put to death or having your family threatened. So I've heard of God coming in visions and dreams to these people. And I believe if your heart is for God and you do want to know the truth, God will not forsake you. I believe he will let you know. The Bible said, preach the gospel to every creature. It said the gospel is going to go out throughout the whole world. Uh, it's very hard to find a place where people have not been preached the gospel. Now, there's there's a lot of places that preach another gospel. They're not real clear on it, but there's not many places they haven't heard about Jesus. I've heard of uh, island people uh, getting a dream and then a missionary being sent to them. One island uh, got, was given a dream that a Somebody on a boat was going to come and it was going to save everybody on the island from drowning. It was a vision that he was going to come save their souls from perishing with the gospel message. So he stood on the edge of the beach every night for weeks until the boat showed up that he saw in his vision. So I do believe that if a person wants to know the truth of God, if they have limited information, if they're wanting to know truth, God will get it to them. He is not unjust and he's not a, a, a respecter of persons. He's not going to give us uh, this great news and then forsake someone in a distant country that really does want to know the truth of God. I really don't believe he's going to do that. Um, so even in the Old Testament, you see him revealing himself to Gentiles. As a matter of fact, Jesus uh, brings up two Gentiles that were of great faith, the widow and Naaman, when he was speaking in uh, um, the temple. He didn't bring up Jewish believers. He brought Gentiles up. It was supposed to provoke them to jealousy. Uh, but uh, you, I really do not worry about that, you guys. I, I don't worry about it because I believe um, it's God's will that the body of Christ go out as missionaries and, and as evangelists to the world but if we have failed in that uh, and somebody does want to know the truth, I do believe God and his mercy uh, and grace will get that to them. I don't worry about people uh, dying because they never heard the gospel and it's not fair to them. I do not have that issue at all. Uh, I, I don't think that's going to happen. 
Okay. Well, Renee, I, I think your uh, your answer is uh, in, it's a it's not an uncommon way of answering this kind of question, and it's be, because um, it's kind of like with the oldest trick question that the world wants to ask us, because we say that uh, we should say when asked a question, what what about the people who never hear about Jesus or never believe this gospel? What happens to them? This is the question Larry King, who just right. recently, recently died, and he would ask every theologian of all types, everyone that comes on our show, he asked him that, and almost every professing Christian uh, minister would come on there and back down, and except for a couple that, that said what the Bible says. Uh, they should say, Larry, the, Bi the Bible said, in fact, Jesus himself said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Right. So here, our, our faith is based on the fact that there is only one way. It's believing in Jesus. If they don't believe in Jesus, they don't go to heaven. They go to hell. But we don't want to say that because people think that's unreasonable. It's unfair or, or whatever. But that's the Bible. There, we do have two groups of people. Yeah. There are two groups. We don't believe in universal oh, where everybody gets to go to heaven in the end. We have to take a stand and say there are is a group that will perish, and there's another group that gets everlasting life. Uh, but it, 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 I think it's kind of wishful thinking, to, to, and I don't really see anything in the Bible to support your conclusion, Renee. Even though it's it's nice, I, I, we all want to believe something like that that every person was God's going to find some way to get the gospel to them. But well, really, it does, it does the, say it. the question you, 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 that, that was asked, you didn't really answer that question. The question was a person who actually never does hear or believe the gospel. We're not not someone that, OK, they they want the truth and they're seeking the truth. God will find a way to get it to them. Well, that's not the, that person, because that person did hear the gospel. Somehow God got it to them. But how oh. about the person that how about the person that never got never did care enough to and they they never did he, hear it and never did believe it well we got to stand on the fact that hey there is a, a a problem that needs to be solved and it's only solved by jesus if you don't put your faith in jesus you go to hell now in my 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 position and, and renee your position too is that these people are, are not going to be uh, tortured forever that would really seem like christianity and and the bible is just very unreasonable and ridiculous and unfair and unjust I would teach but, that anyway. yeah but the fact that the fact that the lost people do not get eternal life they simply perish and will no right. longer exist right. that to me is is uh, the way of saying that god is not unreasonable and unfair we we all will die and perish unless we believe in jesus and receive the gift That's of right. eternal life well well i'm the reason I, my answer was what it was is the bible does say that even the people in the Old Testament, the pagan nations, they were condemned because he gave them proof of his existence as the creator with creation and conscience. And they turned to idols and that's why they stayed lost. So I believe that had they responded to him as creator and their conscience that the next step would have been taken. So it's, it is biblical. My answer was based on scripture, but uh, I see what you're saying. If let's just say per adventure, it did happen. A person never heard of Jesus or the gospel. Well, Jesus said that they shall not see life. Uh, it's interesting because a lot of Christians, they really don't haven't studied the doctrine of hell. They, they think that a person dies, they're lost in their spirit goes to hell and they stay there forever and they're tormented. But that's not what happens. In scripture, when the person dies, there's a place called Hades or Sheol. It's called the dwelling of the dead. That's all it is, the place of the dead or the grave, right? Then at resurrection, at judgment, the lost are risen in physical form. It's not a spiritual thing. It's physical form they are raised up. So the Bible says, that the saved put on immortality. The lost do not put on immortality. They are raised up in a physical body, but God would have to give them an immortal body 
so it could burn for all eternity yet never be consumed but jesus said fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in gehenna and nothing in the old or the new testament says eternal conscious torment it's a misunderstanding of metaphors and idioms uh that were used in the old and new testament and the book of revelation is a vision of these things representing something else and people have taken that as literal so uh that's where this error comes in it also came in because there were a lot of gentile converts that brought in the belief that man is immortal that his soul is immortal the greek pagans believed this and they were plato philosophers they studied plato so when we say they never heard the gospel we believe they die twice they're raised up they stand before the judgment seat of god in his mercy they had a nice life whatever and because they didn't know jesus they do not have everlasting life they die again it's called the second death that's why a jew calls them twice dead twice dead people plucked up by the roots fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell or Gehenna. So. Um, I believe they it's not like he's going to keep them alive or keep death alive. Death is destroyed. That's gone. His enemies that uh, are rebellious and hate him, they're destroyed. And then Christ is all in all. Everybody that's left, Christ is in them in, in the new kingdom. So, um, yeah, it's it's merciful, but it's still just. The lost perish. They die. They're they are uh suffer everlasting destruction that means they're destroyed forever eternally eternal punishment meaning they're going to abide in that state they'll never rise again so um i think a lot of it's just misunderstanding words like eternal fire they think it means uh it it, it burns forever fire is not quenched it just means you can't put it out with water it's a, not a natural fire and the source is eternal so hopefully that's why uh, I don't insist people agree with me on it, but I do ask that you study it a little bit more uh, and accept that the position actually makes a lot of sense. And it is a biblical position. Uh, if you studied it, it answers these questions because if God eternally consciously torments a person, he has to one, grant them immortality indiscriminately. Uh, and all those that never heard the gospel, that, that doesn't sound right to me, does it? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I can't judge God, but it sure makes sense that they just don't have eternal life. That's all. They got their life here, whatever it was, and that's it. That's all they get. Mm, amen. And I'm sorry to have to tell some of you this, but I have a playlist on that. <laughs> The playlist is what is the fate of the lost? I might have, I think I might have changed it. What is the fate of the dead? I, one of the two. And it talks about, uh, you know, the people who, uh, what happens after we die if you don't, if you're not saved. And so watch that. And Renee is, is correct that there's, it, it, this is not just something we want to believe because we don't like the idea of eternal torment. It's uh, certainly very clear in the Bible when you really study it as a whole. Uh, so if you're, if you're not uh, um, uh, familiar with all this, then go to that playlist and, and uh, there's plenty of information to, uh, I think, prove the point. Um, okay, Brother Jordan, do you want to say anything more about that one before I, I have another question in the chat room that we can answer real quick? If, but did you want to say any more on that one? No, I think you guys really hit it home. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, by the way, that question uh, about, you know, what about the people that never hear the gospel? Uh, you know, that's that is the standard in any book on on uh, Christian uh, apolo apologetics, that's that's like the number one question. Everybody has to be able to answer that question because people are gonna ask you that. Um, there, here's a question from Mia Pratt in the chat room and she posed it as a true false. Says, she says, um, uh, idolatry is anyone or anything we make more important than God. Is that an accurate way of defining uh, idolatry, uh, Brother Jordan? 
I would say certainly true. And we see it through so many different avenues. You don't have to make a little doll or statue and bow down to that to be an idol. And I think that's what so many people think about just because of accounts like Babylon and all that in the Bible. An idol is anything we put before God because that is what idolization is. And we can even make ourselves an idol in our eyes. We can think of ourselves in a God in a sense. Anytime we are prioritizing anything, and we've all been guilty of it, and I'm sure many of us, even since we've been saved, idolizing certain things over what we know God would like. Um, some common things that we see idolized, uh, movie and TV stars, they may be promoting a lifestyle sin, or maybe some of the things that we tune in for are sinful in nature. That's a form of idolization. Um, pornography, that's another form of idolization. Sometimes we can even idolize our partners to the point where we're willing to rearrange and compromise our entire lifestyle for another person. So absolutely anything, anything, person, goals, anything that we put ahead of God is idolization. Okay, thank you, brother. All right, Sister Renee, you got the question? No, I need a second. You want me to go or you want to just wait a minute? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I think that Brother Jordan's absolutely right. Uh, it's basically uh, idolatry is like... Um, you know, in the Ten Commandments, it says, you know, shall not have any other gods before me. Uh, and that's what you're doing is you're elevating anything else, whether it's a, a different type of uh, religious belief or whether it is just an interest or a hobby or something that you're passionate about. Uh, let's say you love dance and that's more important than God. And you, you, you love uh, your uh, um, football. You know, you, you, you're really, really into watching the NFL and that's more important to you than loving and worshiping God. Then that, that's become your idol, another God. Um, so really there's no, there's an endless list to what it could be. It could be what, uh, like the rich young ruler, Jesus uh, concluded that his other God, his idol was uh, money uh, and he told him to sell everything he owned and give it to the poor. And because uh, he, he knew that that young man, that was more important to him than a relationship with God. So uh, it is true. I think that you phrased the question exactly right. And uh, idolatry should be thought of uh, in that way. Um, I found it. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I found it. Uh, I was looking for a verse. That's why I need a minute. Um, yeah, so I'm sure, let's see. In Colossians 3, 5, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So to covet something or have a desire for it is idolatry. So uh, I guess anything, you know, we even have uh, celebrities here. They become idols and uh, Hollywood you know, they're proud of that. They have American Idol. That's somebody's ambition is to be an idol lifted up greater than God, to be something people worship. And if you don't think they are worship, go to a rock concert and see how many girls are pulling their clothes off and falling down and fainting uh, when they see their favorite rock star. So uh, it's it's crazy. But yeah, it is biblical to say coveting is idolatry. Um, putting more faith in something like Brother Luke mentioned money. Uh, the rich young ruler, like he mentioned, uh, he, he Jesus shows him because he boasts all these I kept since my youth up. What lack I yet? Jesus tells him, oh, OK, OK. Uh, if you want to be perfect, sell everything. Come follow me. Oh, can't do that because he was very rich. Jesus was only showing him that his money was his God. He had not kept all of the law since his youth up. And sadly, John MacArthur and people like him take that verse and 
say it means that he wasn't willing to give up everything and follow Christ, which is not the message at all. Uh, and some people actually go further than that and say, see, Jesus even told him he had to get saved by works of the law, that he could have eternal life if he kept the commandments. Uh, technically, yep, that's true. Except Paul said, if there had been a law that could have given life, verily righteously would have been by the law, but it's not because it can't. It can only bring death. So um, there's a lot of things, I believe, that are idols, especially to uh, Western civilization. Um, and you know what? We're all guilty of it. A lot of people feel secure if they have a nice retirement account. They don't worry about their future as long as that retirement account's there. But if that gets taken, are they really going to trust God's going to take care of them? No, they'll be in a panic. I'm guilty of it myself. I'm guilty of that. You know, we know deep down that our father's going to take care of us. But we also know that he will allow us trials and discomfort so that our faith may be tried, refined as gold tried by fire. And we don't like that. So we we panic when that happens. Um, so I think we're all guilty of this sin. And uh, it's interesting. That's another sin that a lot of lordshippers don't think that they commit idolatry, but they do. Everybody covets. I don't know anybody that is free from that sin. I think everybody covets. Want something that someone else has or even want something else when they have something that should be fine with them. They have what they need, but they still want more or something else or something better. That's coveting, which is idolatry. So a lot of Christians are guilty of this sin. We all still are. And I like what you said, Renee, about like how people get so worked up at concerts that they um just pass out because isn't that something that we also see in a lot of these charismatic churches? Yes, yes, like, it is. It's crazy. Like you see such a hype up sense of reality. So they're similar. Um, I mean, a lot of these charismatic churches rely on major performances and all these other things. Um Oh, there was another thought that I had in there. Oh, so, and it's also like you kind of alluded to what people need to realize is this is what makes sin so dangerous is it's, it looks like one sin on the outside, but it's normally sin stacked on top of sin. Like Renee was saying with like uh, idolatry, coveting, the same thing can happen with, you know, lust idolization, adultery, yeah. fornication, like right. they just stack after each other. That's what makes sin so dangerous. It's a cancer to the spirit. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Whenever I see a, a movie or, or a show about somebody going to prison, I can trace it back to the first sin that started it. And then it spreads out and all these other sins are happening to cover it up to, you know, it's just, it's crazy. You can take it back to the original sin and see all the sin and bad choices that were committed after that. Um, every tragedy stems from sin. Um, you were talking about the passing out like in charismatic churches. I don't know if you guys know this, but there's an atheist that has mastered the art of hypnosis and knocking people out like slain in the spirit, like Benny Hinn and those guys do. It's actually a mind trick that can be done. And he goes around and does it and then ask her, do you believe in God now? And they're like, yes. He goes, well, I'm an atheist. I don't. It was a trick. And so are all these other pastors. And it's really hurting the faith because uh, a lot of people wrongly so put their faith in these false signs and wonders. And it's really wicked. Um, and so it is actually hurting people's faith. But these people shouldn't be doing that in the name of Jesus and claiming it's the Holy Spirit anyway. But it's interesting that you mentioned similar things like fainting and falling out on the floor and all of that stuff yeah yeah it's true yeah and it's also like you said like nobody just wakes up one day to rob a bank like it's a very slow oh, yeah. fade oh yeah 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 um that's why i've said that uh, uh sexual sins uh, uh fornication uh adultery these are things that people it doesn't just happen like all the times people just say well hey it, it, it just it just happened like we just fell in love and had this adulterous relationship and no you don't it's like it's what happens is slip on a banana pin falling on your butt yeah oh i fell on my butt well that just happened 
But no, these things, there's a whole bunch of doors you got to go through. One door, and then another, and then another leading up to this final uh, act. Um, but uh, I wanted to say that uh, before we move on, that uh, the uh, um, on one hand, the Bible tells us uh, there, there's a, one of these Ten Commandments is to, I forget exactly how it's stated, but uh, honor your father and mother, I believe. I think it says that either those words are that they're about honor your father and mother. And I assume that would mean that you love them too, if you're honoring them. Uh, and yet we, we hear Jesus say that if you don't hate your, your father, you're not worthy of me. If you don't hate your mother, you're not worthy of me. And, uh, and this is another example of, okay, we, on one hand, we're supposed to love our family. And, we're, and not only that, we're supposed to love uh, our, the, our fellow man, uh, the, uh, our brother. We're even supposed to love our enemies. And yet Jesus says that, that we've got to hate these people or you're not worthy of him. And that what we need to understand is that that's a, a he's trying to make it uh, give you the relative uh, concept of relativity. Uh, as much as you love someone, your love for God should be should be so much greater that your love for the other the person is, is, is so low in contrast that it is almost like hate. Uh, and, and, and that's how much we're, we should be loving God. Now, who does it? Is there anybody here who loves God that much? Uh, and that, as Jesus said, he, I'll condense the commandments down to these two. I love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Who does that? Anybody? Can anybody claim that you have actually loved God with your whole heart, soul, mind? and strength and that would mean that every moment you've never lapsed even for a moment of this ultimate pure absolute love for god well i, I can't claim that i don't think anybody can so oh, they do they do claim <laughs> yeah some people would claim that i guess but these things fortunately even though um uh, we're not uh, uh these things are are uh, commandments we're think we're told not to do certain things and to do other things but thankfully uh, since it's impossible to do it perfectly, we have Jesus as our as the uh, the remedy, the, the rescuing us because we're so imperfect. That we, um, the other thing, have you ever, ever heard the term bibliolatry? Are you familiar well, with the term bibliolatry? They worship the scripture. Yeah, uh, we're okay. Let's say a person. Th this has actually happened to, to some people that. Their, their faith is in the Bible. Now, I, I believe the Bible is the word of God. And all, all of my beliefs are going to be based upon what the Bible tells me. Uh, how, however, there are people, though, who believe, just as I just said, same thing, except that when they find a problem in the Bible that, that they can't resolve, and then they come to the conclusion that there's an error in the Bible or there's a contradiction in the Bible, it... it their faith was in that instead of the person. Our faith must ultimately be in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is my savior. I'm not, the scriptures don't save me. The scriptures tells me about Jesus and how I can get saved. But if my faith is in the scriptures instead of the Lord, then that means anytime I struggle in the scriptures, how often do we struggle? How often, how many yeah. questions do we have where uh, I don't either have an answer or a real good answer or, uh, you know, we have conflicting answers. And there are people, though, that their faith is bibliolatry. They're idolizing the Bible instead of idolizing and worshiping the Savior. And that's why their faith is shaken up when they find a conflicting verse they don't, they don't know what to do with. Instead of going, well, Jesus is my savior. He's my foundation. Uh, God's not a con God doesn't contradict. It's not a uh, one to cause confusion. So I must be interpreting this wrong. I'll get. I'll figure this out at some point. God show me. But my faith is still in Jesus. We shouldn't be shaken because you're right, brother Luke. It is in Jesus, the person, and the scriptures. It says they. Jesus said, "You seek the scriptures, and in them you think you have eternal life, but they which testify of me." So it yeah. tells you who he is. And what he's done so i agree with you brother luke that can be a problem i i also believe it can be a problem if you go too far that direction though 
because Final Call 07 used to say, this is not the word of God. Jesus is the word. You mm -hmm. should not be yeah. denying it was the word of God, saying it's idolatry to trust yeah. your Bible. I mean, that's crazy, too. We can't go that far. But yeah. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. And that's a, that's a good point because uh, uh, every, I think every truth. So, so here's the truth. You'll have one group take the truth over here farther and farther, and another group take the truth over here that that direction farther and farther. And what they do is they go to one extreme or the other, and it's no longer the truth anymore. And it, uh, either bat water baptism, uh, and, and uh, you know, so many examples that or that that's what they do is that they the there's camps or sects or denominations of people who uh, they take uh, a, a legitimate uh, Bible. Uh, question or subject or doctrine and then they they take it too far one way or the other and now they've it's no longer um, true 